All right. Good morning, everybody. I just started the recording, so we are going to jump right in the lecture for today, which is going to be lecture two for module three. Uh, we are still dealing with inheritance polymorphism. Okay. Um, we have just reviewed, not reviewed, discovered the array list class last time. So now we are going to dig into inheritance, and hopefully next week we'll start on polymorphism. So the most obvious question whenever you start a new topic, of course, is defining the topic, right? So let's try to, to see a little bit what inheritance is all about. So um, I already mentioned that when we just started the module. Uh, the idea is we want to apply the dry principle, don't repeat yourself, okay? And uh, inheritance is going to help us do that. It's going to help us factor code that is common in multiple classes and put it in one separate class. And then those other class are going to use that class in which we factored all the redundant code. Um, so the relation between the classes that we're going to introduce to allow this reuse, this type of reuse, is what we call inheritance. Okay. So what we are going to, to use um, is going to be our, our running running example, okay? We're going to use a geometrical shape like we did before, like circle, rectangle, triangle, etc. And we are going to see that they have like a lot of stuff in common. So we're going to identify that stuff and then we're going to create a geometrical shape class, which is going to be what we call a super class, okay? From which all of those circle, rectangle, triangle class are going to be inherit. And this is how we are going to, in practice, do that factoring of redundant code using inheritance. So we're going to start with rectangle and circle. Okay, we're going to take the rectangle and circle class that we have been using previously in the textbook as, a, as an example. Okay, we're going to take a closer look at them and we're going to try to identify what they have in common. This is going to be our first step toward applying inheritance. So here are two UML box diagrams of each of the class, okay? So we have the attribute as usual. So attributes here, here, our constructors, uh, a bunch of methods here and here, okay? And if we look at, uh, at all of this, attribute, constructors, and method, there is a lot that is redundant. As far as the attributes go, a circle and a rectangle object are going to both contain color, a boolean that uh, tells us if when we display that uh, the geometrical shape on the screen we want it to be filled actually with the color or not uh, a date created which is going to be a timestamp indicating when that object was created we've used that in the past okay um, so all of that is is exactly the same so in both classes the definition of those three first attributes would be pretty much a cut and paste of the same code. And then we have the stuff that is specific to a circle that you don't find in a rectangle or vice versa. For example, the circle is going to have a radius. So that's a new attribute for circle. Uh, that one we're not going to find in rectangle. However, in rectangle, we're going to find a width, a height, and these are not going to be found in circle. Okay, so we kind of get a feel here that there are common attributes, common data between the two classes. And then there are there are attributes, there is data that is specialized, specialized sorry, for each of the class. Well, let's keep looking. What about the constructor? So the constructors, um, they, well, they are different in the sense of they have a different name. Okay, so that was to be expected because these are two different classes. Uh, besides the name, uh, what do we find? We find like that the circle constructor uh, tends to refer to the radius. And so we're not going to find that in the rectangle constructors. The rectangle constructors they tend to refer to the width and the height attributes. Again, we're not going to find that in the circle constructor. But there is still some stuff that is common. Okay, the stuff that is common is since both classes share, you know, a color and a field attribute, then one version of the constructor in each class is going to allow the, the user of the class uh, to create object and specify the color and the field attribute. So this is going to be common. If we were looking at the code inside this constructor, we would also find out that 
both constructors, uh, both classes, actually one constructor, at least in both of the classes, is updating upon creation of an object, this attribute get created. Okay, just like we did in our examples before. So again, a lot of commonality, but we still have some differences as well. So right now we are trying to sort out, you know, how much those two classes differ and how much they resemble one another. All of this, exactly the same. Okay, the getter and setter for color, which is one of the common attributes in both class, it's going to work the same. Uh, same thing for ease field, set field, get it created, and to string. Okay, and I don't know why this is a, the data type here is a string x, it's just a string. Okay, um, so this is a typo. I'll fix that. All of those methods, six methods total in each class, are literally a cut and paste of code from one to the other. And then, well, and then we have like things that are a little bit different, right? This is the stuff that talk to the um, radius attribute that refers to the radius attribute. So it makes sense only to exist in the circle class. The width, the height, same thing. Any method, any getter, setter, or method that uh, involves, you know, the attributes that are specific to a rectangle here, well, yeah, they are going to be only in the rectangle class. That makes sense. And then we can get the area of a rectangle and the perimeter of a rectangle. Um, and these, actually, uh, yeah, we find them here, too, but they are going to be computed differently. All of that stuff in yellow right now, this is pure contradiction of the dry principle. So this is something that we want to just avoid, okay? So that's going to be our target for applying inheritance. Inheritance is supposed to allow us to remove all of the code that is redundant between the two classes. So we're going to see how to do that. Before we jump in, before we jump in, uh, have we ever encountered two classes or more that are really similar, like uh, like the ones the previous slide, okay, rectangle and, and circle? Do you remember seeing an example in those lectures or in the readings in the textbook of two classes that share a lot, a lot of stuff in common? So the exam practice to do classes? No, no, they don't. Uh, they don't share that much in common. Okay. Uh, book, same thing. So book did, uh, didn't share much in common with any other classes. Uh, think about uh, last. What was it like? Two lectures ago. My integer class has a lot in common with BMI, but I have to look again. Okay, so all of those examples that you have been uh, putting, they might have actually some things in common, okay? So what I'm aiming for here, let me let me clarify a little bit. What I'm in, aiming for here are two classes that have maybe 80% of their method in common, something like that, okay? So what about the wrapper classes? Remember when we looked at integer and we looked, looked at, I think, double, okay? and we compared them to one another, we had like two UML diagrams on a slide. And it was another one of those situations where, you know, there was a lot in common, like literally a lot. Uh, same kind of uh, of uh, constant here, uh, attribute serves the same purpose, even though it's a different type, okay? And then there were like all those conversion methods that were common and stuff like that. So it's not unusual, uh, right? It's not unusual to end up with a bunch of classes in your application, or if you are using a, a library or a framework, uh, to have a bunch of classes that have a lot, a lot, a lot in common. But the deal is that you don't want to make those classes um, a duplicate, a cut and paste duplicate of one another. So inside the JDK, inheritance is actually very heavily used. Okay. For example, uh, for the class integer and double. They are both, we call that subclasses of a superclass. So that means a subclass inherit from the superclass, right? And the superclass represent pretty much everything they have in common. And in the case of the JDK, it's the class number. So in the class number, you're going to be able to abstract a lot of the stuff that is 
among both integer and double classes, okay? So again, it's not, it's not unusual as a situation, uh, but it's very common to address this kind of situation with inheritance just to avoid that kind of redundancy. So now we are going to do the same thing that the JDK did with integer, double, and number, okay, or close to. We are going to apply inheritance so that all of that yellow code is actually extracted from the class circle and from the class rectangle and is instead put into what we're going to call a super class, okay, the class from which circle and rectangle are going to inherit. Uh, and we could call that super class geometric object. So there we go. We have one more class added to the mix. We are going to refer to it as super class of rectangle and circle. Reciprocally, circle is going to be a subclass of geometric object. Rectangle will be a subclass also of geometric object. So we are going to have this new uh, row in, uh, in a UML diagram that's not going to have actually a, a diamond at the end, but a regular uh, row head, okay? That's going to allow us that, allow us to say that the class circle inherits from geometric object. So it's always a subclass inherits from the super class, okay? And all that yellow code, almost all the yellow code actually, got moved into the super class. So that means that now I have the concept of, uh, I have a geometric shape, a geometric object. The, nerve, the term object here, I should really change it to shape uh, because object can be confusing with you know, an object that we create in our program. So let's call it geometric object, but remember this is the concept of a geometric shape, okay, in general. Um, so we say that every geometric shape that our program is going to manipulate has three attributes. We remove the three attributes from you know, each of the class circle, rectangle, rectangle. Now they are here. And we're going to have a constructor. Okay, so the constructor is going to be specific to geometric object. The constructors are where um, it's maybe the, the most difficult to, to factor redundant code. Okay, you can see that here, for example, we still have those two attributes, color and field, that are going to still hang around our constructors in rectangle and circle, and there's really no easy way to, to get rid of them, okay? Um, none that I can think of right now. So here, the constructors, yeah, they are going to, they're going to remain a little bit um, kind of messed up, let's say, okay? Not really, but you know what I mean. Uh, they are going to remain a little bit redundant in terms of the attribute they have, but everything else, that big block of attribute has been already factored into the superclass. And all those methods that, that pretty much worked on those attributes uh, that have been factored, well, factored. Well, all those methods have been factored as well. Okay, so all of that stuff got moved literally into a, a third class called the superclass that we named geometric object. Okay, and it represents any geometric shape in our application, including circle rectangle, and maybe over some more, you know, if we end up creating more uh, classes like circle and rectangle. All right, and then here and here we have what is specific to a circle, what is specific to a rectangle, all the code that cannot be actually uh, put in a common pool, pretty much, if you will. Okay, so we are left with something that is a little bit more streamlined. Okay, uh, everything that is common to all geometric shapes is in that class named geometric object. Everything that is specific to the circle is in the class circle. Anything that is specific to the rectangle is in the class rectangle. So when you have, um, when you want to expand your code, extend your code, when you want to look for a bug, when you want to look for where a feature should go, etc. It's much easier when each class has pretty much a single responsibility, right? It's really laser focused on doing one job, or in this case, modeling one entity of your application domain, for example, all rectangles, uh, instead of messing around and having the code spread everywhere. So Mark has a question, how would you connect the superclass to the subclass? So the connection generally goes one way, meaning that we say, the circle class, that is a subclass, is inheriting from the superclass, okay? So I guess the opposite uh, relation would be the superclass, um, <laughs> I never quite thought about that, what would be the term he used here? 
uh, the superclass is reverse inherited by is inherited by there we go circle okay but we don't we don't uh, we don't talk about that relation uh, generally we don't use it at all it's always we declare that one particular class is a subclass of a superclass one particular class inherits from a superclass always in that direction that we make the, the declaration so we connect them only in that direction um, and but the result is the same. There is a superclass subclass relationship. Okay. Uh, Jacob mentions the terminology parent and child. Yes, this is a, a terminology that is used a lot also in object oriented programming. I think it, it's been phasing out progressively, or maybe it's because I've been focused on Java for, for a little while now. Uh, but I have the feeling that the, the parent class, you know, the superclass used to be called the parent class, and the subclass are called the child class, uh, at least in the Java world. Uh, people have been adopting the superclass subclass terminology instead. Okay, but this is the same idea. A child class uh, would inherit from the parent class. Okay, so the relation is, is the same. It's just a vocabulary that has evolved a little bit. Okay. Uh, Mark was saying, would you go over an example like live coding? Yeah, absolutely. We are going to get there. Okay, I'm going to go for an, for an example in the slide. I'm going to do live coding. No worries. Okay, but right now I'm just setting the stage. I'm putting the, the big words up front, so to speak. They're not really that big, okay? Uh, but I'm I'm trying to define things, and then we're going to start applying them. Applying them, and generally, yes, this is where the understanding crystallizes when you apply the stuff. So, why do we need before we we go there? Why do we need one more relation? Why do we need one more association? Okay. Um, Inheritance is a big deal for object-oriented programming, at least historically, I would say, but it's irrelevant nowadays, I think. Um, the idea here is it's just another mechanism, okay? It's just another mechanism to allow us to uh, keep that dry principle going, okay? At least as a very uh, first level, this is really what inheritance helps us with, okay? Uh, meaning that we, our goal with us is was uh, we are going to write code and we are going to write it into classes so that we can use abstraction encapsulation and by using all those uh, those nifty leveraging all those nifty nifty code properties we are going to pretty much have code that is easier to share with other and a side effect of having code that is easier to share with other programmer is that you can share it even with yourself. What I mean with, by that is that today you work on a small project, you write a class that, I don't know, uh, your class maybe like parses uh, an Excel file, you know, and uh, retrieves some data from it. Well, if you write it as a class, you are more likely to be able to reuse it later and extend it and extend it uh, in other project. So six months, one year, two years, three years down the road, you're going to need to do a task that involves, you know, reading data from an Excel file. And you're going to turn back to your good old class that you wrote, you know, a little while back. So reusable and uh, shareable are two quality for code that are kind of like overlapping to some extent. Okay? And inheritance is really just a way to do that. Okay. To make generic, more general classes that are going to factor out of the specific classes everything that is in common. All right, so now let's talk about progressively the more pragmatic stuff, okay? How does that work? How do I do it in Java, okay? So this is the mechanics of inheritance. Okay, so far, the, the big thing we have been saying is I can have a class, so let's call it uh, class X, okay? It's a subclass of class Y. So UML diagram would go, here's the, here's the class Y, is the class X, and we draw this array. Okay, this is nice, but that doesn't tell us much about what's happening. Okay, all we know is that some code that used to be in X is now stocked away in the class Y. So, how does that work? Why is X still benefiting from being able to access to that code? Well, that's the crux of inheritance. When you say class X inherits from class Y, Okay, when you create an object of class X, so you're creating here an object, I'm going to represent it as a circle, okay, an object of class X, what's happening is that this object of class X contains all the attributes and methods of the class, of its class, that is X, and all the fields, attributes, and methods of its superclass is Y. 
So it's kind of like, this is going to sound bad and this is really not what inheritance is all about. Trust me, we're going to go deeper than that. But at the superficial level, it's almost like you have this automatic cut and paste, okay? Between the class Y and the class X. Once you have said that X inherits from Y, then everything defined in Y is a part of X. But it's not written in the class X, which means that if you have another class Y, that also has all of that code, okay, he has a class Y, just by saying it in a, uh, sorry, uh, it has to be a different name, Z. Uh, just by saying that the class Z inherits from Y, suddenly all of that code here gets copied between quotes, okay? It doesn't really get copied, but conceptually, yeah, a little bit. So it gets copied, made available into both X and Z. Okay, so now when you create an object of class X or class Z, uh, that object has access to every, everything from its own class and everything from the super class of its own class. Okay, question from Austin in the chat. When you call the math class, would you be inheriting the math method? No, when you call, for example, when you call math but, uh, square root, SQRT, okay, you're calling a method. Uh, more specifically, it's a static method. Uh, so this is just a method call, okay? When you call a method, like for example, get a date created from your class circle, again, you are creating, you are just calling a method. This time it's an instance method, not a static method, uh, but this is just executing code, okay? Here, what we're talking about is, we're talking about a mechanism, I'm going to go backward a little bit. We're talking about a mechanism that takes place when you define the class, okay? Not when you actually run code and call code, okay? When you define the classes, you say pretty much a rectangle object is going to have access to all of this, which is what we did you know, in module one, module two. If I define and create a rectangle object, an object of class rectangle, it has access to all the attribute and method in the class rectangle. That's what we have been doing so far. But now, because we also mentioned that the class rectangle, when we defined it, we said, oh, by the way, the class rectangle inherits from the class geometric object. Now, suddenly, when you create an object of class rectangle, it has access to all the attributes in rectangle, as before, but also all the attributes in geometric object. All the methods in rectangle, all the methods in geometric object. And for constructors, yeah, I have like a longer story to tell you about that. But for now, let's focus on just regular method and regular attributes, right? Question from Jacob. Could we make every class we make one giant sub subclass pointing to a single superclass? Actually, what's happening in Java is that every class that you make, let me rewind back and go back to where we were at in the slideshow. Every class that you, that you make, Jacob, in Java, and every class that we have been writing since COP2512, okay, uh, each of them actually uses inheritance. Uh, but we never mentioned it, we never did anything with it really. It's because by default, and we're going to talk more about that later, okay, but let me just give you a teaser here to answer your question. By default, every single class in Java inherits from one, what you would call one giant superclass, okay, which is called object with an uppercase O. So there is that one class object in the JDK. And think about it, since a superclass is supposed to contain what's common to all of its subclasses, well, object contains what's needed, what's common to every possible imaginable class in Java. An example of such a thing, a two-string method. Remember, I kept telling you guys that two-string was going to be everywhere. Technically, it is already everywhere, okay? All of the class that we write, they inherit two string from the, the super class of them all object, okay? But sometimes we want to write our own version instead of using the default version that we inherited. This is what we have been doing in the last past, uh, actually in the last module specifically. Let me catch up with the chat. Uh, Joseph, my trouble is accessing all of that stuff without getting errors. We're going to work on that, okay? So once I'm done laying down the, the rules, the syntax, and lo looking at example, etc., then you are going to have patterns that you can actually follow uh, to to repeat those kind of uh, those kind of things, okay? And then when you get specific errors, well, piazza, 
office hours, okay, so that we can help you out so that you don't get stuck for one hour dealing with a one compiler error, okay? Every, we could make every class a giant chain so we never have to rewrite anything. Well, it's not that ideal, okay, but it, it, you, what you said captures a little bit the idea of object-oriented programming, right? The idea of object-oriented programming is, for example, um, well, we talked about the ArrayList class yesterday, right? So now I kind of define vaguely inheritance for you uh, in the past 10 minutes. So what if I could write a class, like for example, uh, I don't know, like a, an invoice, uh, an invoice, yeah, an invoice would work. Uh, what if I could write a class like invoice, but instead of managing a list of invoice item inside of it, whether I do it with a basic Java array, or an array list, okay? Instead of doing what I asked you to do pretty much last module and I'm asking you to do in the first free practice exercise for this module, what if I just said my invoice class inherits from array list? So that means that everything inside array list, all the methods, all of the attributes that exist there, they are like now immediately transferred to my class invoice. Uh, that's pretty cool. That means that my class invoice for all purposes and intent is kind of like a, a version of a release that's specialized. So it can add, it can remove an element, it can do all the things, all of the stuff now has been inherited. This is what I'm going to, to lead you so that you can uh, achieve it and do it on your own through the last free practice exercise of this module, okay? So that's just giving you like a, an advanced a view of what, where we are going with all of this, okay? And I would not mention that now, but since you are bringing questions that are really right on track in that direction, I will confirm that, yeah, those are good questions. And yes, we're going in that direction and we're going to hit that, that spot exactly where those questions that you have right now already um, are going to be fully answered. That's our goal. This is where we're going to, what we're going toward. All right, so the, the idea here is that relation of uh, superclass subclass, okay? It's a relation of specialization, meaning, meaning that the geometric object uh, is just, you know, it's just a class that contains everything that is general enough to be common to all geometric shapes that my application is going to handle. And then circle has all of this, but in addition, it has everything that is specialized required for a circle, okay? So it's another way to look at the, the parent-child relation, like somebody mentioned in the chat, or the subclass, superclass relation, the inheritance relation, it's a really a specialization. I'm going to have another version of my superclass that is much more specialized. And specialization means that you can do everything the superclass does, plus more, okay? So you are absolutely a geometric object. You can do everything any geometric object can do, Plus, you can compute, you can manage your radius, for example. That's what makes you a circle, okay? All right, so these are the big ideas. So now you should have at least a vague, you know, idea of what kind of relation we try to, to build. But now my job is to try to make it more concrete. So to do that, we're going to start talking about syntax, look at Java example and stuff like that. So our first example, we are going to have a class main. This is going to be what some people call our driver, okay? Uh, it's just going to contain the main method. Uh, inside the main method, so I'm going to use my running example, circle, rectangle, geometric objects, okay? I want to create an object of class circle, create an object of class rectangle, okay? And put the reference to those two new objects in two reference variables. Nothing new, okay? This is stuff we did in module one, module two as well, okay? Nothing new there. So now I introduced my class geometric object. So I have my class main. So let's assume this is a UML diagram. This is the stuff here, the attributes and the method. Now here's my class geometric object. Again, method uh, and attributes are listed there, even though I didn't put them because it would be tiny. Okay, so I introduced that class geometric object. I put dot, dot, dot here because this is exactly the code that I had on the previous slide. Okay, I'm not going to repeat it. And then I introduce my class circle and the dot, dot, dot again, everything that we saw on the UML diagram two, two or three slides ago. So attributes method. And then this is the crux of it. 
I'm going to connect the class circle to the class geometric object by saying it extends geometric object. So at the very beginning of your class definition, when you say class circle, opening curly brace, or public class circle, opening curly brace, whatever, okay, this is where you add after the name of the class extends, followed immediately by the name of the super class you want to extend. So that keyword in Java extend, uh, maybe it would have been clearer if they use something like inherit from, okay? But the keyword extend actually makes sense, okay? It, it's really that circle is a specialized version of geometric object. It does everything geometric object does plus more. So this is how you can make sense, you know, of that keyword extends. The class circle really brings more features and functionality to what a base geometric object is okay all right so once we have that that's it that's all we have to write okay now in the code of the class circle is going to be everything that is not already in geometric object i don't need to repeat it anymore because that extends geometric object statement is going to allow me to inherit it already so all the attributes that are, that are marked in yellow that are put in geometric object i don't need to repeat them in circle and similarly when I write the class rectangle, I'm going to say also that rectangle extends geometric object. So I'm going to be left with only the code that is specific to a rectangle object to write in the class rectangle. But everything that's already in geometric object, I don't have to repeat it. By saying extends geometric object, I just inherit it automatically. Okay? So the syntax to, to say that a class inherits from another class is pretty simple right it's just one statement right at the top when you define your class actually one thing that that is worth mentioning from the get-go is that relation inheritance it's transitive okay meaning that uh, i can have like I, I took an example here that that could be an example from a, a library that allows you to uh, either uh, design like, so for example, single page web application in Java. That would be weird now. That's that's a stupid example. Let me rewind that back. Uh, let's talk about a library that allows you to write a graphic user interfaces on your desktop. Okay? This is much more reasonable given what Java is good at. Okay, So in that library, you would have, for example, a class that represent what is common to all objects that are representing buttons. In your graphic user interface okay uh, that class is very pragmatic i want to create a button okay in my pop-up window okay so this is what you are going to use but now maybe this class inherits from another class that is named for example clickable and the class clickable is is abstracting is sorry factoring away from the class button everything that is common to any graphical user interface element that you may interact with by clicking it. For example, button is one of them. But if I allow, for example, URLs to appear in my graphic user interface with a specific shape, form, like a label, for example, and I can interact with them by clicking them, then I might want to declare another class named URL, which is, again, is a very pragmatic class that I'm going to use to build my user interface. And I can say that it inherits as well from clickable. So again, I, w I found uh, myself in a situation where uh, if I didn't have inheritance, well, there would be a lot of code between button and URL, everything that handles the mouse click events and stuff like that, that would be in common. So I choose to put it into a super class and have those two class inherit from that super class. And then, well, maybe it's clickable, maybe it's not clickable. So maybe I have another class clickable here and another class not clickable okay that differentiate the two different kind of uh, object we we can find in our graphical user interface there are still going to be things that are common to all elements of a graphical user interface for example um, a link to their parent you know window or pane uh, a graph um, coordinate position uh, within a pane where to locate them stuff of that nature okay well so i'm going to abstract all of this in a class named widget, okay? So every widget is going to have, for example, coordinate, I don't know what else, color, stuff like that, okay? Everything that I can think of that every possible element 
graphical user interface element in my uh, framework, in my library, is going to share a factor it all the way up to that class. So you can say clickable um, inherits from widget. If you add a class not clickable, okay, you could say it inherits also from widget. You see where I'm going with that? What could be not clickable, for example, just a text label. So here's a class. Again, this one is a pra very practical class, okay? Button, URL, labels. These are the class I'm going to create object uh, of and that I'm going to use to, to create my user interface. But then every code that they have in common, I factor it like that. This is called an inheritance hierarchy, okay? Widget is a super class of clickable. A clickable is a super class of button. So button is a subclass of clickable. But since the relation is also transitive, we can say as well that button is a subclass of widget, an indirect subclass, okay? There is an intermediary in between. And we can say that widget is a superclass of button. It's not the direct superclass of button, but button is one of the subclass of one of its first subclass. And it can go on as long as we want, right? The, the, the relationship, the chain of, uh, of that transit positivity can go on forever. Okay? You can have as many classes as you want. So let me catch up with the, the chat before we go further. Uh, Mark, weird question, but what would happen if you wrote rectangle extend circle? Well, then you would have to be careful, okay? Because if you say rectangle extend circle, okay? So that means that rectangle would be, well, to, to use the, the diagram that is here, okay? Button would be rectangle clickable would be circle, and then geometric object would be widget. So you have to be careful because what you are saying really here is a rectangle is everything that a circle is plus more. But that's not completely true, right? And this is more of a design issue maybe, but it's still important for object-oriented programmer. You cannot say that the rectangle can do everything a circle can do. For example, the rectangle cannot tell you its radius. The radius of a rectangle is not a notion that's defined, you know, in our example here. Um, so you see, you can sometimes you can be tempted to introduce inheritance relationship uh, where they don't belong. So I'm not going to go into more detail into that, but there is a, a what is called a solid principle, like a guideline for, for writing good object-oriented program code, which is called the Liskov. Uh, what is it called? Liskov. Uh, uh, slip my mind. Um, it's, uh, it's pretty much a property that ensures that substitution, there we go, the Liskov substitution principle. It's a property that ensures that if you tell me that, for example, rectangle extends circle, then everywhere I am able to use a circle, I should be able to use a rectangle. And in, in the example that you, brings up, that you bring up, we are clearly violating that property, okay? We are clearly violating that property, so we are misusing inheritance. This is going to be a little, is going a little further than what this class is intended to do, but since you brought up the question, I wanted to address it fully. Bottom line is the relation, the inheritance relation, has a very specific meaning. If you start throwing, you know, inheritance connection uh, like a little too lightly without thinking them through, then you are going to to build very bad object-oriented uh, code. Um, and this is one of the reasons for which we have this this big ongoing we have had for decades for at least a decade, uh, this ongoing discussion about, you know, should we use inheritance, should we use composition? Uh, personally, my, stand, my point of view on that, where I stand is, uh, think carefully about which one you want to use and use the right tool for the right job. Uh, inheritance is still useful for some specific application and scenario. Uh, just make sure to not overuse it, which probably what uh, we all common, commonly as uh, programmers have done for a little while before you realize that uh, it was not good, okay? Jacob, in regards to the GUI aspect, graphical user interface, as actual images of things like icon put inside the Java code, uh, now there would be assets, generally speaking, but the Java code is going to load the data from your assets, your PNG and whatnot, and is going to render them uh, to make, for example, an icon or, or like a sprite or whatever you need, you know, on the screen. Uh, and as, so is clickable a subclass to widget? Yes, definitely. Drew a rows up and down for button and widget, but I don't see any for clickable. Did I miss it? Hold on. Let me, you know, this is a mess now. Let me clear this up. So you can say that button is a subclass of clickable. This is this error. Clickable is a subclass of widget. Indirectly, button is also a subclass of widget. And then widget is a superclass of clickable. Widget 
uh, clickable is a superclass of button, and indirectly, widget is a superclass of button. Okay. All right. I hope that I, I clarify and answer your question like that because the diagram was getting a little confusing even for me. So at least this, yeah, it, it, this should be easier to uh, to catch. Yeah. Don't hesitate to let me know when things are getting a little confused because scribbling on the screen, um, you don't realize how, how many layers you put. After a while, you are always focused on the nuance layer. So I try to clean my uh, scribbles regularly if i forget just let me know it's getting confusing okay all right what about multiple inheritance and and i almost fell for that when uh, mark asked me uh what if you you write that rectangle extend circle okay because right now both rectangle and circle they extend geometric object the class geometric object so when you ask me uh, what if rectangle extend circle my first thought was what do you mean do you mean on top of extending geometric object, in addition to extending geometric object, or you know, instead of. And I chose to only answer the part of your question that matched instead of. But now let me address, you know, what if somebody wanted to say, for example, rectangle extends both circle and geometric object. That will multiple inheritance. That means that one class is going to inherit from multiple class. Let's take a, a silly example, but it's a it's a very high level common sense example. So it's going to talk to everybody regardless of technical detail. We have in our applications the need to model data about human beings. So we have a class human, and it contains every data and method we need to model actually object that represent uh, for the purpose of our application a human being. And then we also have a class it does the same kind of job, you know, but it models data and method related to fish, fishes that we are managing in our application. So multiple inheritance would be to say, I have another class, and that class inherits both from the class human and the class fish. Meaning, the meaning of inheritance, right, once again, is every attribute in the class human, I want to be able to use them in an object of class Aquaman. Every attribute of the class fish, same thing. Every method in the class human and every method in the class fish, I want them to be available to any object of the class Aquaman, okay? Some object-oriented programming language will allow to do that. For example, Python, okay? I like to mention Python because this is a language that either you already covered in COP2512, if that was a language of choice for your first uh, introduction to programming, or that you are going to cover soon uh, as part of the information technology and cybersecurity tracks, okay? So it's kind of a good idea to start laying the, the, the land there and telling you the difference between Java and Python. So in Python, yes, you can do this kind of stuff. In Java, no. One of the early design decisions of Java was uh, that we are not going to go that route. C++, for example, is another language that allows you to do multiple inheritance. So multiple inheritance, especially the, the way it was done uh, a while ago before Java even came around, was actually a bit problematic. So that's why Java designer decided to avoid it entirely. Okay? Uh, you can still use object-oriented programming and do great things, you know, without having multiple inheritance in your language, okay? Um, and at the end of this class, we're going to discuss something called interface that's going to pretty much uh, cement that idea and show you how we get around some of the limitation, okay? But in Java, yeah, one class always extends only one superclass, okay? Now, be careful. That doesn't mean that one class can have only one superclass. You see why? So repeat for, for everybody. In Java, a class can only extend one other class. Okay? But that doesn't mean that a class can only have one superclass and one superclass only. And you reconcile those two statements. Do they make sense? And if so, me why in the chat or is that a contradiction for you and if so mention something else in the chat so that i see where we stand and give you the explanation if needed bingo john positivity so john figured it out it's a super class you have only one super class right for any class that's the one that you extend 
that superclass is just a class, right? So it can also extend another one single, you know, over class. So that means that the superclass may have a superclass, the superclass may have a superclass of its own, and suddenly because of the transitivity, uh, then uh, the class at the bottom of the chain has multiple superclass on top of it. Okay. Question from Jacob. So for the Aquaman example, fish would have to be a subclass of human. Um, so if we wanted to do that, this kind of this is going to be weird, but yeah, if we wanted to do this kind of stuff, so I would remove this relation because I can have in Java only one superclass. And I would say, for example, Aquaman is a subclass of human. So Aquaman inherits from human. And instead of using fish, let, let me use something like uh, animal, okay, or mammal, right? And I would say uh, a human inherits from the class animal, okay? And then there we go. We would have like a, a relation a set of relation where every class has only one super class, but as we did in the diagram before, okay, I can say that Aquaman is a class of human. Human is a subclass of animal. Indirectly, Aquaman is a subclass of animal. And then I can read the, the, the relations the other way around. Animal is a superclass of human. Human is a superclass of Aquaman. Indirectly, animal is a superclass of Aquaman. Okay, so what I did here is draw all of the possible arrows relation, okay? Uh, but when we do a UML diagram, there's only the extend relation, you know, the one arrow that go from one superclass one su uh, to its, uh, uh, one class, sorry, to its superclass. Uh, but what I did with those extra non-UML arrows is explain to you that when we look at this, yeah, the indirect relationship also constitutes inheritance relationship, even though they are not explicitly uh, marked on a UML diagram. Okay, on the UML diagram, you would have only those blue arrows. So only one direct superclass, but could be infinite number of indirect superclass. Yes, in practice, it's not going to be infinite, uh, but you get the idea. Yes, they can be superclass or superclass or superclass. Uh, since I already mentioned it, because somebody was really this close to, to unveil the, the secret of the object superclass of them all, okay, uh, Think about it. You can have Aquaman is a subclass of human. Human is a subclass of mammal. Okay. And then mammal is a subclass of animal. And then you keep going like that. And then what's going to be at the end? Uppercase O object. This is the Java superclass of them all. Okay. That class has no superclass of its own. Okay. It doesn't extend anything. This is the end of the, of the path. Okay. This is the absolute superclass. So that means that any class that you write in Java, even if you don't say anything, if, even if you don't use the extends keyword, is going to be directly or indirectly, if you use the extends keyword, related to the class object. It's going to inherit from it directly or indirectly. And this is why toString, for example, is available everywhere. Okay. What about visibility modifiers? So now that we have like uh, we have this uh, all those definition about what it means to inherit, etc. Um, what is the impact on private, default, and public? That's the first level. And then once we clarify this, is there any extra visibility modifier that would allow me to say, for example, I grant some privileged access to my subclasses, whether they are direct or indirect? And the answer to that is yes. There is one more keyword, okay? So private is a keyword, public, protected is that new keyword. Default is the absence of keyword, okay? You remember, it's not actually a, a keyword that you use as a visibility modifier. It's just when something is not private, protected, or public, and we say it's default visibility. So we have one more visibility modifier keyword to take into consideration. So informally, Private is still the absolute lockdown. Public is still everybody can do whatever they want. Protected is a little more open than default, okay? In the sense that it's going to allow us to make exception for subclasses. So default, protected is going to be like default, but when you are a subclass of a class that has something protected, like a method or an attribute, you are going to still be able to access it like if it was public. So that's why it fits between default and public. 
So as you go from left to right, right, you have increased visibility. One quick note here that is actually important. When you start doing uh, inheritance in your code, when you start using inheritance in your code, and you say, my class inherits from, for example, the class human or student or whatever, you have to be careful and pay attention to the visibility modifiers that are used in your super class. The one rule is you may decide that something that was public in the super class is going to be now private. Actually, no, sorry, I, I use exactly the counter example of what I was trying to say. You may never, you may never decide that something that was public in your super class is now private. In other terms, you cannot lock down your subclass, something that the superclass already decided should be visible to everybody. Okay. I use public and private, but it's true, you know, along that, that whole spectrum of visibility, meaning that if something is protected, you cannot downgrade it to default visibility in your subclass or private or stuff like that, right? You have to be at least at the same level of visibility or above, okay? So we're we are not going to jump into those problems a lot, okay, in this class, because we try to avoid um, repeating code between the superclass and the subclass. But once we talk about overriding, and that's going to come probably next lecture, so we talk about a technique called overriding, then yes, we are going to have to pay attention to this, okay? So I just mentioned it here because it's part of the inheritance. Uh, once we do overriding, it's going to make a lot more sense. This diagram, this table here, you need to bookmark it or memorize it, whichever works for you, okay? This is a, an easy way to remember what uh, what is the role of each of the visibility modifier, okay? Uh, it's easy because there is a triangle matrix here that says all of these are okay, and all of the, the ones in the lower uh, triangle are not okay. So it's very visual, pretty much. All you have to remember is we're going to consider public and protected and default and private, okay? So the order here is increasing privacy as we go down the list. And then as far as the columns go, we are going to start for with what happens within my own class, okay? So I'm writing a class, one of the fields is public or protected. Uh, what does that mean? Can I access it or not from the code of my class? And then what happens if I'm writing another class is in the same package as my class. What happens if I am writing a subclass, whether it is or it is not in the same package? And finally, what happens if I am writing another class that is not a subclass and that is also in a different package? Okay, so like the, the order here, we are getting farther and farther from our class. Okay, uh, within the code of the class, yeah, that's the closest we can be from uh, our own class. We are inside of it, okay? The same package, these are buddy classes, a buddy buddy with one another. Subclass, yeah, it gets some privilege even if it's not in the same package. And then finally, something that's not in the same package at all, and that is not even a subclass, that's like, a, that's like the least access possible. So if you understand those two column and row ordering, then yeah, what's public is good for everyone. No trick there, okay? Similarly, what's private, well, it's only good for the code in the method of your own class. So you can access a private field or a private method only if you're writing another method uh, in that same class, okay? Everybody else gets denied. So we have the two extreme. Everybody gets a pass, everybody else gets denied. As a matter of fact, if you look at the first column, when you are writing code inside your class, really visibility modifiers do not matter. You can always access everything. You are the one writing the code for the class. You know, why would I lock myself out of my own class, okay? Uh, so it matters only to consider visibility modifiers when you're talking about an overclass, which is in the same package, maybe a subclass, or in a different package, okay? So we made sense pretty much of a big chunk already of our table of our matrix here. And then let's take a look at default and protected. So default means review from module two, right? Default means that if you are in the same package, 
and the class that has a default method, a default visibility method, a default visibility attribute, then yes, I'll let you access it because you are in the same package, okay? But everybody else, get out. And then protected means, so the same default, plus if you are in the same package, so I already took care of that. If you are already in the same package, I give you access. But if you are not in the same package as a class that has a protected visibility, you know, attribute or method, but you are a subclass, all right, I'll make an exception for you. This is a difference between the two, okay? So if you are one of the subclass, direct or indirect, I'll make an exception for you. And then if you're not a subclass, then no fish, okay? Uh, go elsewhere, you don't have access with that on that data or methods with me, okay? So that's a way to, to understand all those relations in one, uh, in one big picture, pretty much it's easier to, to memorize than to try to memorize each of the individual individual case, you know, in isolation. All right, so an example very similar to what we did when I first introduced visibility modifier. Okay? Um, so the same kind of diagram, if you go back, like, uh, I think it was two lectures ago, you're going to find the same thing here to explain public, uh, default visibility, and private. But now we are going to redo that kind of diagram. But we are going to focus on uh, the new keyword, protected. All right. So first thing to notice, we have two packages. Here we go. Here's one package. And here is one packet, everything else. OK? So these are the boundary boundaries of both packages. All right. Inside those packages, what do we have? So we have this class. C1, the first package, P1, okay? So this is a class where we are going to declare all of our attribute and method. So I'm going to have a protected attribute named Y and a protected method named M, okay? Everything else here, um, yeah, we could even remove it really from this example because it's already covered in the previous module, okay? So focus more specifically on Y and M, all right? So first example, Class C2 is a class that is in the same package P1 than class C1. But there's no relation between those classes, okay? Class C2 does not inherit from C1. Class C2 is not a subclass of C1. So I can create an object of class C1, right? That's okay. That's because uh, class C1 is public. We are on the same package anyway. And then what interests me is can I access the attribute Y? Yes. Protected means, okay, protected is more than default. So default would be not here to give me access. So protected, yes, we will do everything default does plus more. Can I invoke the method M? Yes. Class C2 is a package body of class C1. So anything above the default visibility modifier included uh, is going to be okay and grant me access. But at class C3. C3 is also within the same package. So we know that it has already access to Y and M, okay? Because it just happens to be in the same package. But in addition, it also extends C1. So here is kind of a silly uh, situation because I already have access to Y and M, uh, but yes, since I extend C1, and C1 defines Y and M as protected visibility, then uh, yeah, protected would give me access just because I'm a subclass. But I don't even need to go and check that far. Just being in the same package is enough. Now, it becomes relevant for class C4. Because class C4 also inherits, you see that arrow here, okay, that UML arrow, it also inherits from class C1. So it extends C1. But it is in a different package. So the if anything that is default visibility here, is not accessible by C4, okay? So can I access Y? Yes. Can I access M? Yes, because that's exactly the goal of protected. The goal of protected is that if you are not in the same package, but you are a subclass, direct or indirect, I'll grant you access. And then the last example, okay? Uh, this is the one where we cannot access Y, we cannot access M, because we are a class that is not in the same package than C1, first thing. And second thing, we are not even a subclass of C1. So that means that protected doesn't help us. So except 
for what is public, we cannot access anything from C1. Now, if I said that C5, so let me clear the, the diagram here. If I said that C5 inherited, I'm having trouble here, inherited from C1, okay, then yes, protected would extend me the, the access to Y and M. If I said that class C5 inherited from C4, then class C5 inherits from C4, C4 inherits from C1. So my transitivity, right, C5 is an indirect subclass of C1. Therefore, the protected keyword would also grant me access. Okay? So a bunch of rules, right? So this is what we need to, to go over to kind of lay the land. And now I do realize that for like a good proportion of student, it's still vague. It's not connected exactly to something practical. So this is where we're going to start going into an example. And then the next lecture, or depending on how much time we have or what kind of question we have, I can jump into a live coding as well, just to show you live how to build step by step, you know, an inheritance CR kit. But for now, we already did the first year, which is introducing the concept, starting seeding your minds with all those ideas about inheritance. And now we are going to try to crystallize those ideas into something concrete. So second pass on inheritance, looking at a concrete example. First, before that, Jacob has a question in the chat. Does the subclass still follow that chart with the different visibilities? Uh, yes, absolutely. So let me rewind just real quick. Okay. Um, if I was, so you, you notice that this is the only class where we wrote down actually how we declared attribute and method, what visibility we use. Okay. All the other class, classes here, all I do is create an object of class C1 and then try to access attributes and method. But if I was, for example, in class C3, and in class C3, I decided to declare a protected double W, for example. Okay, here's a new attribute W of type double and it's protected. Well, the same rules that we explicitly here, you know, using C1 as an as a origin, now we could say, well, now I'm considering as protected, you know, so I'm going to write here protected, just pro, uh, double, just D, W, I'm abbreviating, okay? So now I want to know who can access this, that attribute, MW, okay? Well, if it's protected, then C1 can access it because it's in the same package, so can C2. Can C4 access it? No, it cannot access it because C4 is not subclassing C3, it's not a subclass of C3, and they are not in the same package. Can C5 access it? No, because C5 has no connection also to C3, and it's not in the same package. So C4 and C5 cannot access that attribute from C3 for the same reason, okay? So that chart here is really focused on, hey, this is my origin class, okay? And then I look at how different classes in different scenario can access or not, uh, but you can flip that around, like an overclass as origin, the same rules are going to apply. So let's take an example of, of code. And so to, to make it consistent with all the definition and stuff that I have uh, announced so far using you know rectangle, circle, and geometric object, we are going to implement exactly that example to start off with. Okay. So our first practical example will be the ones that the one that we have been using as a it's a running example to just illustrate those concepts. So let's start with a class that was not on our UML diagram, which is going to be test circle rectangle.java. So it's going to be again what some people call a driver. This is just a class that has a main method. And inside that main method, my only goal is I want to play around with all of my classes. I want to create one or more object of class circle, one or more object of class rectangle. Ideally, I want to test out you know, all of the different constructors to make sure they all work. And I want to test out all the different methods that those class have to offer to make sure they all work. Uh, in this slide, there's only a subset of that. It's only the beginning of the test, okay? But I do create at least one object of each class, one circle of radius one, and one rectangle of, I don't remember which one comes first, I think it's the height and the width, so of the dimension two and four, okay? And then I call some of the method, like get color, get radius, two string, 
etc. get area, get parameter on both of those objects. And I make sure that I display the result to double check visually that they are doing what I expect them to do. Okay, so this is our main method. Now we have to write the class circle, the class rectangle, and then the class geometric object because both of these are going to inherit from it. So let's start by the topmost class, okay, the most general purpose class. Public class geometric object. So here are the three attributes that we identified as a beginning of this lecture as being, you know, uh, common to circle and rectangle. Is my constructor. My constructor is actually using that trick that we okay, that the delegation to another constructor with the keyword death to say, if you don't give me any parameter, then I'm going to assume that the color you want by default is white, and uh, by default, your shape is not going to be filled. I'm calling this two parameter constructor, two R constructor. So here's a no R constructor, here's a two R constructor that just takes care of business. Uh, meaning initialize the color field, the field field, and then the date created field. Okay, so all stuff from module two. Um, and then what? Uh, so what is this technique called? We are running out of time, so I'm not going to date you with that. Uh, but we are still trying to avoid code redundancy here, okay, using that delegation with the desk keyword. Nothing new here. Nothing new compared to the previous module, I mean. So this is a review. And then, and then we have what is called boilerplate code. A boilerplate code means stuff that you can almost write in your sleep after a little while, okay? What is it? The getters, for example, generally are very trivial. You want to get date created, okay, I return the attribute to get created. You want to get the color, I return the attribute color. You want to get the value of uh, the attribute field, I return the attribute field. Uh, you want to set the color and set the attribute field, well, I'm not going to do any verification even for that would be better if actually I, I, you know, I made sure that what you give me is actually a color, you know, at least that, right? Uh, you give me a string, if that string is hello word, then suddenly my color for this object is going to be hello word. Yeah, I've been a little lazy here. I should have been a little bit more careful. But still, this is boilerplate code in the sense that generally uh, you wrote it like five times now, that's it. You can write it in your sleep. There's no trick here very little. Then more interesting, the two string method. So when I call to string on a geometric object, I'm going to return a string that say, hey, this object was created on, here's the date. Uh, the color of this object is color and it's field, yes or no, a Boolean field, true or false, okay? And that's it. So I have I've done everything that I could do inside this class, everything that is common, to all geometric shape. Actually, if you go back to the UML diagram, I could have implemented a few more methods. I'm just going to leave them as an exercise. Okay, but come to Office Hour if you need help with that. It's relatively straightforward. It's just like one or two getter or setter that have been omitted here. That's all. Now let's go to the, the more interesting stuff. What about my class circle? So circle extends geometric object. So I don't need to read all those attributes. I add only the attribute that is specific to a circle. 58 total radius is my no arg constructor. Here's my one arg constructor that accepts radius. And again, the no arg constructor, if you don't tell me anything about the radius, I'm going to call actually uh, this constructor here. Oh, sorry, oops. Uh, let me move this over. I'm going to call this constructor here, the free arg constructor. So we have a zero arg constructor, a one arg constructor that just takes a radius. Both of them pretty much differ to a free arg constructor that takes a radius, a color, and a boolean that tells me its field. Then you're going to hear me, and this is not a standard terminology, or at least not that I'm aware of, okay? You're going to hear me uh, refer to that kind of constructor when we have multiple constructor. And uh, this one has the most, uh, the, so I have to say, the most parameters, right? For all the bases. You are going to hear me refer to this as the fully specified constructor. And it's just an informal term, you know, to mean this is a constructor that allows you to specify everything that you can possibly uh, specify, that you are allowed to specify, you know, regarding a circle. So in this case, the radius, the color, 
and whether it's filled or not. The idea of those fully specified constructors is that when you have a constructor like this, okay, then every other constructor is pretty much a, a subcase, a subset of what this guy can do. For example, if you don't give me no, if you don't, if you don't give me any argument at all, sorry about the bad grammar there, if you don't give me any argument at all, right, I'm going to call the fully specified constructor and tell it, okay, this is what I want for radius, this is what I want for color, and what I want for field. Okay. If you do give me one argument and it happens to be the radius, okay, then I don't have to make up a radius. I'm going to just pass directly the value you gave me again to that uh, fully, uh, fully specified constructor. So I take care of the radius this way, and then I make up, make up a, a default color, and I make up a default value for each field. And there we go. Okay. So I still avoid a lot of redundancy. Now, the ones that are most critic among you, um, the ones that are really good at spotting things that do not fit the, the mold, you are going to probably tell me, hey, you are repeating stuff here. Yes, it's true. I am repeating stuff. Okay, so I could I could try to make it a little better than that. Uh, so we're going to consider this as the first step, and then we can talk more. E, for example, um, e.g., sorry, office hours. Okay, but at least you see that I'm still implementing that tree, whereas I defer to another constructor. Okay, uh, so most of the job of initializing all of those fields. The new stuff in the slide is only yes, accent keyword. And then some boilerplate code. Okay, how do I write a get radius? You return the radius. How do I write a set radius? You uh, just assign the radius parameter to the radius attribute. Again, the get method are always trivial. Uh, I don't remember ever encountering one that was not okay, even if you have to do a little bit of computation. The set method, the setters, I'm making them look trivial here. Really, if we wanted to be conscious here, we have done it in the past. We would set, for example, we would check, for example, that radius is not negative. So that doesn't make sense. You have a circle with a negative radius, except if you are trying to model some form black hole, I guess. I don't know. So bottom line is, yes, there are some variations. OK, but it's still boilerplate code. It's still always the same kind of stuff. A uh, little bit more, but this one is not totally boilerplate code. Boilerplate code in some language is automatically generated. That's how easy it is to generate that stuff, OK? Uh, except when you want to graft on it some extra uh, checks and stuff like that. But this here is still simple code, but it belongs to what we refer to sometimes as a business logic. So what's the business of being a circle? Uh, you have to know how to compute your area based on the radius. So that formula here is something that uh, a circle expert tells the programmer, hey, this is how you compute the area of the circle. This is how you compute the diameter based on the radius. This is how you compute the perimeter. So this is um, the knowledge that comes from the application domain. If you write program for a bunch of accountant, a bunch of physicists, for a bunch of biologists, okay, these people are going to bring domain-specific expertise that you are not required to have. But you, as a programmer, are going to interface with those people, and you are going to ask them those critical questions about their business logic that is going to allow you to implement the feature they want your code to have. Okay? And then print circle, um, I could have done two string. That's what we're going to do in the future. But here, just a simple uh, method that just says the circle is created, and here's a date, and the radius is, and here's the radius. And then rectangle, that's going to be exactly the same story, OK? So extend here uh, the attribute that are specific to rectangle, 0R constructor, 2R constructor instead of 1R constructor, because they have a width and a height uh, in a rectangle. And then a 1, 2, 3, 4R constructor. This is a fully specified constructor, OK? So that means that I can delegate all jobs that I have to do to it, pretty much, OK? All right, so this is exactly the same pattern as the circle. OK, there we go. And then more boilerplate code, so getter, setter for the attributes. Uh, please note that we only cover the attributes that are specific to rectangle. And then some business logic, how do I compute the area of a rectangle? How do I compute the perimeter of a rectangle? And that is it, pretty much. We have wrapped up 
The example that we started the lecture with, that we used as a, just a UML diagram to introduce the, the relation of inheritance, now is fully implemented in Java. So for one time, I am almost one full minute uh, short in the lecture. So this is the first time it ever happened. Awesome. Um, awesome from your perspective, I guess. Uh, I'm going to stop the recording now. And we are going to transition, as usual, into office hours. So somebody mentioned, you know, can you do some live coding? If you want me to do so uh, in something like five minutes here, I can definitely do some, uh, retake this example in live coding or very, very similar example. Just let me know what helps, okay, what you need. And we'll use the office hours to go over it like that, okay? So thank you, everybody, again, for your attention. And yes, I finished in time.